I'm just going to test. Okay. We have to use a mic today um, for this introduction. And later, um, when we have a question discussion period, you'll have to speak into the mic because we're live streaming to other university centers as well as people's homes, I hope. Okay? So I'd like to, uh, my name is Ross Hoffman. I, I'm a professor in the First Nations Studies Department here. And I've been asked um, to introduce our guest in the talk today. I, I'd like to start by um, acknowledging that we're on unceded territory of the Kletli Tene, where we have, this is our place we study, we work, we live, many of us, we play. So we want to acknowledge that wonderful thing that we are here. Um, this is part of the Archival Connection series, speaker series, that, that Erica has, has put together, her and her group. Um, and today's speaker is Angie Bain. She is joining us. Um, I'm going to do my best to pronounce this because I want to be respectful. Um, Ms. Bain is an Inthla Katma researcher from the lower Lower Nicola area of BC. She works as a land claims researcher with the Union of BC Indian Chiefs in Vancouver. She works for her community on projects such as indigenous cultural heritage, land use studies, language revitalization, and crown land referrals. And most recently, her community has been working to set up a repatriation committee and has visited the Royal BC Museum and the Peabody Museum at Harvard. And her talk this afternoon, and I'm gonna stick with the English here, is titled, Our Ancestors, Our Grandchildren, Our Journey in Knowledge Repatriation and Cultural Revitalization. So please join me in, in welcoming Angie today. <laughs> Okay, this, is it good? Hear me in the back? Good. Okay. Ekwin and Shnukwa and Shquest Angie Bain, in Shlakat Makchinkin, Tuflutkin, and Jawa. Hi, everybody. My name is Angie Bain. Um, I'm happy to join you here today. I wanted to say hello to you all in the room. Hello to anybody who's watching uh, the, the webcast, and especially to anybody from the regional campuses uh, of UNBC who might watch this online. So thank you all for your interest and time. I'd like to thank uh, Ramona, Trinity, and Erica today, especially for coordinating this series. Uh, I've watched a few of the presentations online, and I feel really honored to be a small part of, of this series. So. Um, as Russ said, my name is Angie. I'm from the Lower Nicola Indian Band, and I'm from a small reserve uh, in the South Central Interior called Zut. And this is my family. Uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging that we are on the unceded territory. Um, this is uh, of the Clately Tene. This is especially important to me because my husband's family, this is my mother-in-law who we just recently lost, uh, but she is uh, from the Kwa family. So my husband and my son are members of the Clately Tene Nation, and so this has personal connection to me. Uh, when I first met my husband, he had been working on a traditional use study up here, and he regaled me with stories about horseback riding in the Goat River and sitting for, you know, hours with his elders uh, listening to stories and getting lost on your back roads. So it's, it's not quite home for me, but it feels a lot like home. So thank you again for, for having me. This is where I'm from. This is the Lower Nicola Indian Band. This is our main reserve called Nicola Mamit. We're an interior Salish group. Um, in the past, if you read any historical texts, we were known as the Kuto, the Knife, the Thompson River Salish, 
are simply the Thompson Indians. And the closest community to ours here is the city of Merritt, which uh, is not too far, five, ten minute drive from this community. We have 1,200-ish uh, band members, and we have 10 reserves. So this one is our largest. It's 11,350 acres, and it's where most of our population is centered. Uh, this reserve was first set up in 1868. Uh, my reserve, if you continue on down that direction, it's towards Merritt and Nicola Lake. I'm at the opposite end of the valley. We are a much smaller reserve of five, 500 acres, and our reserve was set aside about 10 years after this. So I think it's important to give my work some context because anybody who does community work wears many hats. And the projects I'll be talking about really are because of all of these three, three roles that I have. So I work in my community on a variety of projects, as, as Russ listed um, earlier. And usually that's on a volunteer basis, I guess, or a free time basis. I don't have anything like uh, vacations quite often because of uh, the community work calls me home. In my professional capacity, I work as a land claims researcher with the Union of East Indian Chiefs in Vancouver. I serve as a, an advisor on a number of boards and committees, including Heritage BC, First Peoples Cultural Council, and Research Ethics BC. And I want to acknowledge my former colleague in the room here, Miles and I uh, used to have desks next to each other. Miles worked for UBCIC in the past, before he went on to bigger things. Um, finally, I have the great privilege of being part of an editorial team on the Franz Boas Papers Project. And it's through this project that we're working on, the two volumes that I'm going to be talking about, focused on the work of ethnologist James Tate. To date, this project has been going on for a while, but to date we have only one published volume, which came out of the initial conference. Because of these diverse roles and opportunities, my presentation today will likely illustrate just how much this work overlaps and exponentially grows on, on previous work. Because of these opportunities, the knowledge repatriation journey that I'm going to be sharing with you tonight is not going to be linear. It's full of stops and starts, failures and successes. And I hope that by the end of our time together, you leave knowing one thing. Archives matter to communities just as much as communities matter to archives. The what, when, why, where, and how really differ. Um, uh, depending on your project, but fundamentally that's the message I wanted to share. So we're on this journey together, archives and communities, and I may be personally doing this work because I have this connection to the history of my ancestors, and I have the foresight to want to do it for my grandchildren. But this work wouldn't be possible if it weren't for the rich and diverse collections that archives, museums, libraries, and other repositories, and all those people behind those institutions. So it's really been a journey. My career has been full of travel and discovery. And when I tell this story, I like to say it began with a map. So these are some maps of the Inchicapma territory. The map on the left was produced by my community quite recently. And the map on the right, it's a little hard to see the outline. That map was produced in a published memoir in 1900. Which do you think gets cited and referenced? And which do you think is taken as fact? So I don't think it comes as a surprise to anybody in the room that it's the printed version uh, that was published in the ethnography, the Thompson Indians, written by James Tate and published as part of the American Museum of Natural History's memoirs in, the in 1900 is accepted without question. Meanwhile, the map on the left, the map produced with community consultation and input, is something I have to defend on a daily basis. So anyone working with First Nations communities know that 
Um, there's great power in a map. Maps make the difference between whether or not my community gets informed or consulted on projects that may impact us and our community members. Maps are one of the tools that the province uses to undertake internal analyses, make decisions before we even get invited into discussions. But it gets even more complicated. The province uses um, maps like these uh, in addition to their own internal ethnographic reports um, to make determinations on strength of claim. So they'll look at our asserted territory and they'll say, well, Tate didn't say you had an interest north of Kamloops. Here's Tate's map. Here's Tate's published report. And so this is what we believe to be fact. So uh, needless to say, my community doesn't always agree with those reports or analyses. So to say our repatriation and revitalization journey began with a map, it's not oversimplifying it. Because the search for contextual information on the published map led me to maps like this, which despite all appearances that would suggest otherwise, have been very useful for my research. So there's a lot of annotation on here. You probably can't see it well in the back. There's numbers, there's hatching, there's different colors. All of it means something. Maps like these help show how that ethnologist James Tate came to understand our boundaries and even offered some insight into why his published map differed greatly from my own community's map. Along with these maps, which we found at the American Philosophical Society Library in Pennsylvania, or in Philadelphia, uh, also had other related materials. So all of those annotations and numbers, we found notes, correspondence, and other accounts in James Tate's work. We also found something that was not in his published memoir. Uh, after Tate published the Thompson Indians in 1900, he continued to work in our territory. In fact, he started working in our territory in the 1890s, and he continued up to his death in 1922. The longer he worked with our community, and this makes sense, um, the more he learned. And the more he learned, the more he understood. Eventually, he came to understand some of the limitations of his early map. And he wrote to anthropologist Franz Boas, telling him that our territory extended some 90 miles further to the south than he understood when he published his map. A revised map was never printed. So if you weren't looking deeper, you would believe that Tate never revised or understood a different understanding of our territory. So please, wherever your careers take you, uh, after your time here at UNDC, wherever you're doing in your professional life, uh, take the time to dig deeper to understand the context of things that we take as fact. Question why community records may not match published documents and come to your own understanding. These are some photos from the American Philosophical Society that I just mentioned in Philadelphia. So back to my story. That first map led us to the American Philosophical Society Library. The APS has over 13 million manuscripts, 350,000 volumes, 250,000 images, and thousands of hours of audio tape. The collection goes back to the time of Ben Franklin and the formation of the society in 1743. So it's one of the earliest libraries even in the States. When I tracked down the unpublished version of our map, it led me to an extensive anthropological collection and linguistic collection created by people like Franz Boas. And at the time we first started looking, very little had been digitized. But I'm happy to say that since changed. The maps have been scanned as black and white, so initially we had access to some copies on microfilm, but the black and white copies weren't sufficient for our needs. So thanks to 
uh, working with my colleagues at the Infla Katma Nation Tribal Council and the Union of BC Indian Chiefs, we were able to obtain color, color copies of the maps um, and ultimately had our first exposure to the APS. So the maps are now digitized as part of the annotated maps of the Pacific Northwest and are available online at the APS site. This is Tate's handwriting. As a historic researcher, I think it's some of the best that I can work with. <laughs> Since first contacting the APS, our relationship has grown, and we've been able to share with them why the maps are important to our community. The APS has since digitized the maps and scanned much of the related correspondence and notes. So this is just a small selection of the notes that went with that, the, those maps I was showing you. So not only does my community have access to these high quality digital scans, everybody does. And that can only be to the advantage of our community. We want people to have this information. But let's continue our journey. Not long after we tracked down the APS maps, UBCIC got invited to an information se session at the University of Victoria on a project called the Franz Boas Papers Documentary Edition. So I'll just call it the Boas Papers Project. This is a multi-year shirk funded project led by the University of Western Ontario in partnership with the APS, the University of Nebraska Press, University of Victoria, and a local tribal council. The goal of this project is to reassess and recontextualize the papers and correspondence of Boaz. He played an important role in the development of American anthropology, but more importantly to my community, he engaged the work of a gentleman named James Tate, who I've mentioned. This is the very same James Tate who I've referenced as publishing the map. In fact, Tate undertook that work because of Boaz. So this is a sample of some of the uh, correspondence that we've been working with on the Boaz Papers Project. And as you can see, it varies uh, from typewritten material, handwritten material, and we have um, marginalia on the documents that give us some contextual information for his published material. So after Tate passed away, everything that hadn't been published went to Boaz. Boaz at some point tried to make some sense of it. He gave it to some of his grad students, and that's the reason we've got some of those blue markings. So it took us a while to figure that out, but once we did, we understood how we could match it up. And uh, a paper on basketry and a paper on mythology came out after, Bo uh, after Tate passed and largely related to that project. So there are over 600 letters between James Tate and Boaz in this collection. And although we'd seen some of them before from microfilm, we've never examined them as a collection. So as part of the Boaz Papers Project, the APS digitized the entire um, collection of correspondence as their contribution. So when I started the project, the scanning had already been done. So we got to go in and have documents already to work with. Through UBCIC, I continued to be engaged on the project and then joined their Indigenous Advisory Council, uh, which is now uh, no longer in existence. Another story. <laughs> um, and I joined the editorial team working on what started as one volume is now two volumes on James Tate and his work with the Interior Salish communities. As we look, we look more deeply at the letters, we found ethnographic and linguistic information mixed in with title and rights information. Mixed in with pleasantries was the contextual information that my community was looking for to better understand Tate's work. Having access to those 600 letters, as well as Boaz's other correspondence, opened new avenues of research for us. This time, my community benefited from the work between UBCIC, the APS, and institutions of higher learning, like Western University and UVic. And although the project itself is very much focused on a higher level uh, examination of Boaz's work, our two volumes at least 
uh, will be something of use to communities, I think. They're the only two volumes in the project that are taking an ethnographic approach to the, to the, to the work. So these are the gentlemen I've been talking about. On the left is anthropologist Franz Boas, and on the right here is James Tate. Now, this is one of the famous photos. If you, if you know Boaz's work, you've probably seen this photo before. It's an unfortunate recreation of a dance. Um, this is some of the photos that were taken by Tate and working in our community. It's a woman with a root digger. And uh, she's showing Tate how she used it. And if you can see this photo in the bottom here, it's James Tate holding up one of the baskets from our community. So as I mentioned earlier, James Tate's work is some of the most widely cited information on my community. Tate recorded village sites, kinship ties, place names, archaeological information, mythology and stories, ethnologies, and linguistics. He took photos. He collected ethno ethnobotanical specimens. He recorded our names. And he measured our community members. Boaz actually started working with the Intlacatma before he started working with Tate. And he wasn't that successful. Boaz's interest at the time was in measurements. So he was trying to measure the community members, but he wasn't getting engagement. And so he met this, this guy, James Tate, who had already been in my community living and working for a while. And he found his way in. Tate's uh, first marriage was actually to a woman from one of our communities. Her name was Antko. She was an Inslakatma woman. And when he first came to our territory from the Shetland Islands, he worked for his uncle in Spence's Bridge. His uncle owned the store. So he naturally engaged quite closely with our community members. He worked for his uncle for a while, and then he, he went off to Nanaimo and worked in the coal fields but returned to Spence's Bridge and took up hunting guide work. So during my research, we came across a story um, by a linguistic, uh, for, as part of a linguistic project. So the goal in that story was to capture uh, Inslakat McCheen um, stories. But it was a story of a man called Jimmy Tate, or James Tate. And it tells the story of a young man arriving in Canada, not a great horseman, but determined to be able to sit in the saddle with ease. So the story ultimately tells us about Tate's first adventures in Canada and how he came to be uh, important to our community from the perspective of a community member. And that's one of my most favorite stories about him. After reading the story, it helped me see Tate through another lens. Here was a man who loved our country, who loved our territory so much that he took the time to learn to sit in the saddle properly, be ridiculed by people who thought he should be able to ride already, and persevered. Working as part of the project, we gained access to other, um, other collections. This is the Franz Boas Papers Collection on the APS site. So all of those scans I told you about are available online on the American Philosophical Society website called the Franz Boas Papers. But Tate wasn't the only one that Boas was corresponding with. He also um, worked with other eminent uh, anthropologists and ethnologists, including people like Charles Barbeau, George Dawson, Alfred Kroeber, and Harlan Smith. And these are some of the others I don't know. I picked the ones closest to my community. Um, there are probably many others that would have more relevance uh, to communities in this area. The work on this project has led me in many different directions. We've found related material at the BC Archives, at the Royal BC Museum in Victoria, and at the Canadian Museum of History and the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Last year, I received a library fellowship from the APS and got to spend a month looking at a different collection from the one we focused on, one that is, uh, I think, more interest to communities. It's a linguistic collection 
uh, called the um, Committee on Native American Languages, or the ACLS collection. And in it, we found a lot of the things that we had been missing in the correspondence. So a letter from Boaz to Tate would mention attached report or see the list, see the notes. Uh, these weren't generally easily found with the letters themselves. We found some in this ACLS collection. But we didn't find everything, so we had to keep looking. It was frustrating not to be able to put all the pieces back together. We knew they should exist. We knew they were important, so they wouldn't have just been thrown away, or we hoped that they wouldn't have just been thrown away. So we were frustrated, but that led to new research, new collections, and new relationships. So two collections in particular uh, seem to have both related materials, and in some cases, more of the missing documents and reports and attachments that we were looking for from the APS collection. And these were the American Museum of Natural History collection and the Canadian Museum of History collection. The Canadian Museum of History collection has other types of tape material too, um, because that collection focuses on the time when James Tate was working both for Boaz in the States and for Sapir, Edward Sapir, here in Canada. Sapir has his own Boaz connection. In fact, almost everyone at the time had a Boaz connection, so this material always leads you in other directions. But we found some great photos in the CMH collection in Gatineau. These are digitized and online. They're also available in a published book. These are some more photos from the same collection. And this is the sort of thing that my community members really love because we still have people who know the, who these people are. They know their families. They're related. These are their ancestors. And in both the Muse Canadian Museum of History's collection that has the photos and all of these other places we were looking, we were able to piece together all of the information. And we found that what we have are Photos, songs, stories, those physical measurements that Boaz did, and material culture items generally say, shared by the same groups of people. The names were spelt differently. Sometimes they just said, an old woman sold me the basket. Uh, so you had to make the, the associations through the context of the documents but we're spending some time putting all those pieces together so that people can look at something in a museum and say, my grandma made that, my great-grandma made that. We still have a lot of work to do um, to do this. But what we're getting is an understanding of the knowledge, the skill, the understanding of our community members, of our ancestors who are now gone. And it's not a perfect understanding because it's through the lens of people like Boaz and Tate. But it's a new understanding nonetheless. And it's leading us well beyond the published memoirs, reports, and papers. And while we're slowly processing all the materials we've found, we've been incorporating this material into community projects, which I'll talk about next. But these are just two of the published materials. Uh, Tate's work for Boaz is generally available in the Jessup North Pacific memoirs and papers, easily available online. These are uh, community notices that my community puts out whenever we have a project and we try to get engagement or inform our community about them. So I just wanted to show you sort of the breadth of the type of projects that my community is working on. We've entered into land code. We've developed a cultural heritage policy. We've done internal land use planning. We've looked at alternative dispute resolution processes and mechanisms. And most recently, we've been re-examining traditional protocols around things like fishing, hunting, heritage, water, and land. And this work is very much on the ground. 
engaging all sectors, including our youth. And this is us with our band school. We had the Google Trekker backpack, and we got to show kids the technology and do some mapping at the same time. We have big projects like the twinning of the Trans Mountain or Kinder Morgan pipeline, a pipeline that passes through three of our reserves, including my own 500-acre reserve. And each of these projects uh, have three things in common. One is we're being asked to explain who we are. We're being asked to explain places that matter to us. And we're being asked to consider both the past and the future, the generations of our grandparents and our grandchildren as we consider these projects and move forward. Answering these questions pose challenges. We've been impacted by residential schools. Our population has grown while our land base has dwindled. Our traditional systems have been disrupted. More than half of our community don't live on reserve. Many live away from Merritt in, in cities like Kamloops or Vancouver, Kelowna. And many of us, myself included, are relearning our culture and language. Internally, we've worked to revitalize our traditional food gathering practices, work to relearn and share our practices associated with raising and teaching our children in a cultural way and have been seeking ways to reintroduce material culture collections. Here is our cultural heritage policy. This is online. Uh, just do a Google search and you can find it. But we did this several years ago and it's been an important tool for the work that I do with referrals and day-to-day uh, -day kind of band business to help explain who we are and why our heritage matters. In our policy, we brought out three principles. We thought these were the principles that were most easily understood from the lessons that were shared by the community and elders. Our principles of respect, responsibility, and relationships. And in the policy, we, we articulate what that means to us. So, Yamish, Shemit, Klumeshtin, Tekam, Hatamich, Nsitu. That's basically just saying what I just said. Uh, respect, responsibility, and relationships. All the land is our house. In a very preliminary way, it was something that we could use to show our understanding of the Tamich, the land, and our relationship to it. So these are some of the photos. This is an important place to us. It's in Twal Valley, just north of Spences Bridge. This tree is called the Dancing Tree. It's a sacred and spiritual place. And just this summer, I was very fortunate to go out and interview community members for an Indigenous Laws project at the, not this tree, the second tree, um, which is there. And it's actually just up the road from where Tate lived. So our cultural heritage policy references those things that you find in museums and archives and libraries, our songs, our stories, our traditions. So it's largely an external tool that we've developed that builds on all of the work that we've done with the Tate materials. This is my son. Miles might recognize him when he was this big, now he's this big. <laughs> But internally, we've been using the material for other projects. So we did a place name project um, using some of the linguistic material, and we've recorded and mapped our place names. So for this, we've found names in published materials. And these are some of the village sites that Tate listed in his published material. Names that were referenced in letters. So this is one of a transcript of one of the letters we reviewed. And names that we found in the unpublished notes. So these are some of Tate's notes. These names <coughs> are mapped here. 
Internally, we have also created a spatial data layer with this. Uh, this is the public version. I have an internal version that I use um, in our internal web map, and we use it daily to help assert our names, the use of our names in all of the work that we do. Last year, we got a Royal BC Museum repatriation grant, and using this funding, our community decided to keep building on the work that we started and build a community-based repatriation group to continue the work of locating and understanding the material culture collections that we'd seen at museums. So again, my poor son, he comes to all the museums with me as much as I can get him there. We received $30,000, uh, the highest award that was given. It was an inaugural grant by the Royal BC Museum, and a lot of communities were fortunate to receive the funding. Unfortunately, it was a one-time thing so far, and uh, RBCM is trying to get more funding to continue that important work. And with our money, um, in addition to the, all of the work we are doing in the community to talk about the work that we wanted to do as a community, uh, we took a couple of research trips. And one was to the Peabody Museum in Boston, Massachusetts at the Harvard University campus. We brought a small team down there to photograph the entire Katman material culture collection. There are hundreds of items and it took us five days. And we just made it in our five days. This is uh, my son and um, my, my cousin's son the only two youth who, who joined us. At the Peabody, we met some great people and we saw some beautiful items. Most of this material was collected, again, by James Tate. So we had the correspondence from the other research that, research that we had done that helped us make sense of this collection. The records at the Peabody are some of the best that I've seen. Um, the accession information is pretty thorough. They kept good records and you can follow each iteration from the original letter and lists that Tate sent in to the current catalog. Most of the information made its way into the digital version. Not the case in a lot of other places that we visited. But this is uh, Meredith. Meredith and her team helped organize our visit. And the room that we are in here, they finished it just prior to the visit of our community. They painted it, they put in new shelves, they set up a place for us to take photographs just in advance of our visit because they knew that we were coming and they know that community work is important. So we felt very privileged to be the first people to use this. We did some community work with the material from the Peabody. We created a catalog with the photos and transcripts and it's now part of that internal web map system I told you about. It's a data layer that we can use with our other work, just like the place names. And we learned a lot from our time working with the Peabody. I'd say the most important lesson that we learned was how communities can help archives and how archives can help communities. Today we have a beautiful relationship with the Peabody, something that I hope will continue to grow because we still have a lot to learn from each other. The key to this relationship was opportunity. Without the funding from the RBCM, we would never have known how rich the collection at the Peabody is, and we would never have learned about the ways that we can continue to work together. With the funding, we also took a second trip to the Royal BC Museum. It was a different group, a smaller group um, that went here uh, this museum is in Victoria. We went with the same objectives to photograph all of the items, um, but we had a, a different experience uh, at the RBCM. This is some of their catalog information. This is what's available online. So as you can see, places like the RBCM already have photographed um, their material culture items, but usually it's a single photo or two photos. Our community uh, repatriation committee asked for 360 degree videos and photos from multiple angles because community members wanted to relearn how to make this material. 
So that's what we spent our time doing. And this is us at the Royal BC Museum. Uh, the top left photo is our group. Uh, the one time I think we were all together because we, the, the Royal BC Museum has many components. We split into smaller groups, some who went to the BC archives, some who worked with material culture, some who toured the museum, some who um, worked with the archaeological materials. Uh, the center top photo is us meeting um, with the archaeology department at the Royal BC Museum. And they're showing us this material in the bottom corner here and explaining um, what this material is, how it's found, what it looks like. So it was an educational opportunity for our community members. The top photo is us doing a tour of the BC archives. On the bottom here are two of my community members who are discussing some of the photos that we had seen. And we each brought our own cameras and we each wanted to photograph the same items. So unlike the Peabody where we got through hundreds of items, um, at the RBCM, we really took time to engage with the staff and, in, and take the time with the items. So we got through maybe 50 or 60 items there. So our knowledge repatriation has a great deal of personal relevance for me. At the Canadian Museum of History, another place that we visited, not with this funding, but with other funding, uh, we found items more recently made by community members. And this is a hat. And this hat is made out of rushes that, bulrushes that you could find on the side of, the, of Nicola Lake. And I found when I visited this hat that was made by an aunt. And I didn't know she had made it. And so I was reading the accession information and photographing the item. And then I realized, hey, this is Aunt Maggie's hat. Working with uh, CMH, we've explored other ways of working together. So one of the things we did at this visit is we flagged sensitive items. So in my culture, um, there are certain items associated with puberty rituals that we feel have power and that shouldn't be displayed and shouldn't be touched and shouldn't be interacted with in certain ways. Things that need annual ceremony. Um, to respect the power in them. And so we, we told this to the CMH and we got invited back this year. We'll be going sometime this year to help advise on some of the protocols around handling these. And this kind of work, it's not just for us. It's also for the benefit of anybody interacting with these materials. Because everybody comes in wanting to be respectful of it, but we want people to see them as more than objects, but as, as living things things that have a past and a connection to our culture. And the archival staff, the museum staff, didn't know that there's a right way to interact with puberty items. And so we're happy to share that information. The materials held by museums and archives were made by the hands of my ancestors. And the words that were written were the words that were heard by people like James Tate. These people are now gone, but we continue to learn uh, from them and from that work. We need in every way possible to continue to learn things like the place names, the stories, the knowledge of plants and animals and beings. We need to, to learn these things so that our children and grandchildren can understand what it means to be in Tlacatma, where we've lived, where we continue to live and why this all matters because they're going to have to answer those questions. There are barriers and challenges to the work that my community's done. Our relationship with each archive is different and I kind of hinted at, at that with the Peabody and the Royal BC Museum. These are just a few that we've engaged with. We've also reached out to the Smithsonian Museums in the States, so in Washington and New York. And we've had a different experience working with them. The materials we're finding are different, and yet they're not. It's complementary. We're finding connections. We're piecing together the parts that are missing from one collection. And we have the benefit of, uh, I guess, 
the experience in um, seeing one collection and understanding where it fits with others. Something I think that in our own perspective, our own museums and archives, they might just see their collection. So our journey began with a map. It led us to other places like the Nicola Valley, Victoria, Gatineau, Quebec, Philadelphia, New York, and many places in between. Today I shared a little bit about our journey with you, the intersection of the three roles that I've had, community member, a researcher, and a volume editor. And this hasn't been a personal journey, it's been a community journey. It's something I've done on behalf of and with my community. Our work together was possible because of opportunities, quite frankly, because we got funding, because we got access, and because we found those networks that opened doors that we couldn't open on our own. Getting community members into archives and materials from archives into communities is integral to the work in both communities and in archives. Archives matter to communities, communities matter to archives. Heritage, the words and works, knowledge and understanding of our ancestors is the key to work that my children and grandchildren will do on behalf of our community long after I'm gone. What I shared with you today is just one perspective on how we're using the materials in our community. Others are doing interesting work on their own. We have a cultural revitalization team working with our elders and knowledge holders. We have a language nest who is relearning our language and strengthening it. Our leaders are incorporating our protocols into important nation-based work that will ultimately help in our assertion of title and rights and create space for a small community called Lower Nicola in a city of merit in the province of BC in the country of Canada. This work will help recover from the impacts of residential schools to work towards truth and meaningful reconciliation, to build relationships and to understand each other. And for most people, an archives or a museum is not the most obvious place to start work like this. The past is the past. I've had people tell me this. Some see only art or function, or I see title and rights, or I see the strength of our women and the knowledge of our hunters. You won't find documents that answer all of your questions. It will be hard and long work to piece together everything, to understand that a basket that was made by a person who told a story about being taught by an ancestor in a place that had a name, with materials gathered in traditional ways, in places that are still important to us, matters. It will take some vision to see the same basket and understand what it represents to a community. The knowledge, the skill, the connection to the past, an assertion of who we are and our way forward. As I said, I got to see Tate's house when I went, he did the Indigenous Laws Project. So this is our little team who worked on that project in front of the house of James Tate which was just across from the house of one of the community members we were interviewing. So that family had a connection to Tate even today. As you move forward in your own careers after your time here at UNBC or in the work that you're doing, I hope you'll remember our story, how a map led us on a journey back to our ancestors and how we're learning from our ancestors how to teach our children and grandchildren to find their own way forward. Think critically about that which we accept as fact and in your own way create space and, and opportunity for other voices to be heard. Hamelf, Coach Shamuk, thanks again for your time. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Angie. That's really inspiring work that you do in your community as well. Thanks. Continue to love it. Before we go to the room here, I just want to read out an email we got. So if you are out there in the digital world, wherever you are, if you'd like to pose a question to Angie, you can email archives at UNB.
abc.ca, and we'll have somebody read your question out. So I'll just turn it over to those who are present physically. If you'd like to. Sorry, it made me very <laughs> emotional. Is there any chance that any of the baskets, for example, could be returned to you? Yeah, we called the start of our project a knowledge repatriation because at this point we're trying to find where, what's out there and where it's at and find out as much information as we can about the material like the baskets because quite often the accession records are too general so they'll say it's La Katma or they'll say Thompson River Indian. But we don't want to take anything that's not ours and that wasn't connected to our community. So we're taking that time to do the work in the right way to make sure we don't try to repatriate anything that's not ours. Uh, but ultimately, it is the desire of many of my community members to have a lot of this stuff return home. So I didn't mention and you know, and when we talk repatriation, one of the biggest issues out there is uh, the repatriation of ancestral remains. We have done some work um, in the past on that. It's never been anything formal. It was, uh, we recovered some material from the Royal BC Museum, some ancestral remains. We were, got involved with the RCMP and brought them back for a reburial. But it was a very much a who has gas money, who wants to come, hop in the truck, let's go and do this the right way. And then gathering those people in the community um, whose role it is and who have the knowledge of how to do it the right way. So yeah, ultimately we want to get there, but we're pretty far away from that. We don't really have the space or the facilities yet. Uh, we just had a new cultural center or community center built, which we hoped had, would have space for a cultural center, but it can only hold about 50 people and the, the gallery space itself is a fraction of the size, so it's not, not sufficient. Thanks. It was hard to decide what to focus on for this talk because I know it's probably not most applicable to Tanis's class who's joined us. Um, but uh, what I wanted to just emphasize is that um, things like materials you find in museums have relevance in all kinds of places that we may not see or know. Hey, Miles. Hi, Angie. Very interesting presentation. Thank you. I have a forward-looking question, Okay. I think. Um, with changing media, um, recently the Printer Citizen is going to digital only. So with um, content being driven by the user uh, more nowadays, how, how can archives capture um, the community. You mentioned the relationship between the community and archives and archives in the community. When content is going to vary or has a potential to vary between individuals so much, yeah. how can that be captured in a responsible way? That's a tough one. Uh, and I've got all the archivists here in the room like, ask me! <laughs> um, but from, from my perspective, uh, um, I've seen kind of what some of the organizations we're working with have been doing. And the APS is one of the places that I think is, is doing a good job. So I mentioned the thousands of hours worth of, of oral recordings that they have. And those recordings go back to the time of wax cylinders and, and the wire um, recordings that, that they used to have. Um, you can look at almost every media along the way 
from broadcast quality um, v VHS um, materials to uh, the most current, which is a, a, a thumb drive um, with uh, digital files on it. And so they are aware of the need um, to keep collecting, but it seems like with them, and I think the trend is out there, um, the onus is also on communities to help make sure that um, this material gets to the, to the archives if that's where we want it to be. So there's going to be gaps, and we have gaps. We have huge gaps, actually, and um, generations. And that's why the stuff from way back from great-grandparents is so important to us today. And that's why the stuff that we're gathering is so important for us today. But a lot of the work that we're doing at the community level is not stuff we can readily share. And it's things that belong in the community, so we'll never see in archives. So I guess it really depends on um, how much of ourselves we want to see um, in these places and how much we want to keep internally. You guys are an easy group. <laughs> Hi, Angie. Hi. Um, you showed several pictures of your son joining you on the trips to the museums and the archives. You speak of the next generation preserving the knowledge and continuing the task. How have you gone about engaging youth mm. within your nation to, to take part in this project? Yeah, it's been a challenge. Um, like any community work I do, uh, there's always a set of of, I guess, uh, communities I want to be involved and it always involves youth and it always involves elders and it always involves whatever particular knowledge holders I can think might be relevant to the project because I think every one of those bring a different perspective to the work you're doing and your project can't be complete without them. And so we've tried um, things like, um, we have a band school, so that photo I showed you of all the kids out there we um, ask to go before them and do presentations or spend time uh, in one of their classes. Um, we get materials that we collect to their teachers who we know might be teaching about um, you know, the, the silverberry capes, for example. Um, we just did that. We had an open house um, last weekend where some of the teachers wanted our photos from our trips and we make sure that what we collect gets into the hands of people who can pass it along. Because one thing I, I learned at another conference was if you can get the nine or ten year old talking about the thing that's important to you, that's the way that you can engage the community in your project and get that interest. Because those are the kids who are talking to their parents and their grandparents, they're talking to each other. So we, we have um, community fun events that we have the kids at, and we bring our photos and displays, and we hope, we haven't had the time yet to do it, but we wanted to get some replicas of some of the items um, from the Royal BC Museum in particular, because we have a project around a copper mine, and what they found there was an atlatl, which is quite unique. Um, to our area, and we know it's important, and we want them to see it and understand what it is and why it's important. So we wanted to get an, a replica, um, something the kids could play with. So still lots of work. It, sometimes it's hit and miss, though, with the kids because they have other things going on, and so sometimes we get a lot of them, and sometimes we get none of them. <laughs> Thanks. Any online before we? No, good. Uh, hi to all of our, I have some colleagues who may be watching online, so hello to everybody. 
So once again, Angie, this extremely rich, the work you're doing. It's so multi-leveled, um, important work, and uh, we wish you the best with it, and, and thank you for coming and, and sharing with us today. Oh, thank you. And keep an eye out for our two volumes. <laughs> I'm going on a writing break uh, in a couple of weeks and trying to finish off our draft for press. So, thanks. It's the uh, correspondence between Boaz and Tate. And we are focusing on different periods in his life. So we're annotating it. I'm working with... Um, uh, Andrea, Dr. Andrea Laferrette, who used to be with the Museum of Civilization, um, somebody named John Hogan from the Intlacatma Nation Tribal Council, and he does a lot of cultural programs, Dr. Andy Palmer from the University of Alberta, and she does a lot of work in New Zealand, and Sarah Moritz, who's a um, postdoc PhD, uh, who worked with the Statlium uh, around their traditional laws and governance and issues like that. So wonderful team, yeah. Thanks everybody, thanks for your time. Thank you.